Hi guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out with us today. We're really grateful for you tuning in, and if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully, you've subscribed so that you never miss an episode, but if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, animaltrainingacademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the Animal Training Academy website. Some of the ingredients of the membership include forums with hundreds of training videos and projects where together the community helps problem solve different training situations. We have the private Facebook group to share animal training successes, member updates, and relevant content. On top of this, we have WhatsApp chat groups. And we also connect live twice a month in members-only live web classes, where we dive even deeper into the topics you will learn about here today. All previous web class replays are additionally stored for you to watch at your own convenience, and the content area has been referred to as Netflix for behavior nerds. To find out more about membership and how you can join the community and carry on the conversation, visit www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click the membership button in the main menu. But we will get started on today's episode, where we're going to be talking to one Morten Egtvet. Norwegian dog trainer Morten and his wife Cecilia have written three best-selling books about clicker training. They have also published the Nordic dog magazine Canis for exactly 20 years this winter. They are owners of Canis Clicker Training Academy, the leading clicker training dog school in the Nordic countries. They have personally trained more than 200 new clicker training instructors in Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Finland since 2003 through their now famous clicker instructor course. Morton has trained dogs mostly for high level obedience and working dog competitions. He has also trained dogs for search and rescue and for military service for many years. He is a trained biologist with a degree in ethology, but he's always been much more interested in applied behavior analysis than ethology when it comes to practical dog training. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Morton to the show today. Morton, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me, Ryan. It's an honor. It's an honor to have you on the show today, Morton, and we're really appreciative of you taking time out of your busy schedule to come and hang out with us. Uh, no problem. We're gonna... It's always fun to talk about dog training. Yeah, and my journey sounds quite similar to yours. I've got a degree in ethology as well, but I'm way more interested in applied behavior analysis. <laughs> yeah, isn't that uh, interesting? <laughs> Kindred spirits. Morton, could you please, to start us off, take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and tell us about some of the first animals you ever trained using it. Well, I got my first uh, dog when I was uh, 16. And I think the first two years I trained it kind of traditionally um, with mostly positive reinforcement, but also some corrections. But uh, actually, I think I discovered uh, when the dog was like three years or so so, uh, that positive training worked so much better. So... um, and I think that first dog was four or five years uh, when I discovered clicky training for the first time. Uh, and then, of course, everything changed. But um, I trained that first dog to a quite high level with um, kind of old school dog training. And uh, then he was uh, sort of a crossover clicky training dog uh, the last two years of his life. So, so, so when, when I got my first dog, it went kind of quickly. I think he was, uh, when he was uh, two years old, he was already certified as a search and rescue dog. And I think we started in the national championship for working dogs for the first time when he was three years old. Uh, I was 19 then. So, so it went rather quickly. And that's kind of typical for me when, 
when I find an interest, I really <laughs> just dive into it and try to learn everything that is to learn about it. And so when I first discovered clicker training, uh, I really dived into that too. And uh, it's kind of amazing how quickly I learned it really looking back. So, And so bring us up to speed now. You've been operating Canis for 20 years. Yeah, we we started Canis in 1998, and at that point we had uh, clicker trained our dogs for uh, three years, uh, about three years, and we were kind of really passionate about that new technology, and we really wanted the rest of the world to, to know about it because back then. Uh, at least in Norway, almost no one knew about clicker training. So that, of course, made it very exciting to to go out and and teach it and and offer courses in clicker training for for dog owners when no one has heard about the clicker before. So so that was a really fun time, and uh, so we had a very steep learning curve. And when you're telling this part of your journey, you're saying we. So you're referring to yeah. Cecilia. So we're about yeah, to Cecilia coming. We are, we are kind of like one person. So <laughs> except when we are arguing, <laughs> but we we agree on most things in dog training. And so where did you guys originally meet each other? Well, we actually met um, doing search and rescue training. So. So this is when you're about 19? Um, yeah, I think she was probably 19, 20. I was one year older. So that's also a good story. But uh, I don't think that's the topic for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Has it got to do with dog training? You, you obviously yeah. know my dog training. Well, uh, it's, well it, it is a fun story because um, uh, she came to my city to, to study and so, so I met her when she uh, on a search and rescue dog training for the first time. And interestingly enough, uh, her dog was actually she, that dog had the same father as my dog. So uh, that's a lot of uh, it, it's a fun story. So completely coincidence. Yeah. And and that kind of pulled you together. <laughs> Well, I, I like to think that it was more than that, but <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it didn't touch. It's, it's kind of like fate, though. I mean, what, what are the odds? Yeah. What are the chances? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I'm, I, th- I think I was more curious about clicky training in the beginning than Cecilia was, because we were kind of both traditional trainers, and uh, she is probably a little bit more skeptic than me. <laughs> I'm kind of curious and open when it comes n- new new things to learn about. But she was kind of hesitant in the beginning. But um, it took a few months, and then she was on board, and then then she caught on very quickly. And uh, and she, she's a really good trainer. And so this the difference was at that time between what you guys were doing before clicker training and before you learned about positive reinforcement, what you were doing in the search and rescue scene? Yeah, when we we also trained obedience and it was ordinary old school dog training. A lot of positive reinforcement, but also a lot of corrections when the dog did something wrong. And we, we really didn't know what we were doing. So we did what the other people were doing and we tried the best we could. So it was <laughs> trial and learning and reading books and picking up what uh, what made sense. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting time. So I, I don't think I would have wanted to be without that experience. It's kind of interesting when nowadays clicky training is often the first first kind of tr- kinds of training a new dog owners is introduced to and uh, in some way he uh, he misses a lot of uh, uh, let's call it uh, interesting experience when so uh, because y- you see the difference between that old style of training and clicky training you you see the differences so clearly when you have been on both sides of the fence hmm. And how did everyone else in your circle 
of, of friends and trainer colleagues at the time take this change? Did they want to come with you or was there resistance? <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's a long story of resistance. <laughs> But uh, the good thing is that neither me or Cecilia, we, we have never really cared much about what other people think. So that has really been an advantage. So it's, it's kind of been a fun challenge, really. That's interesting. I want to talk about that a little bit. So do you think the, the fact that you haven't cared what other people think has helped you become successful? And I ask this because, Morton, uh, there's also there's always a lot of pressure for people to yeah. do what they're told, mm. uh, and and you've obviously gone well. I can see that there's a better way. What the dog's telling me is more important than what other people are saying. Yeah, how how important do you think that was to Canis's success and your guys' success? Uh, um, I don't know, but I really think what was really useful for me in the beginning when I started to clicky train my own dogs and started to teach other people about clicky training is that I had already achieved really good results uh, re- results with my dog. So, and it's it's really hard to argue when you <laughs> when I have the dog in front of me and. And he can show all those great behaviors. It's it's very hard to argue with that. So uh, so so I really didn't have to care much about what other other people were saying, if that makes sense. So uh, I think it would be much harder if I was a completely new dog trainer trying to start out with clicker training. Then I would have been uh, much more 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 sensitive to criticism and and so on. But I, I already knew that I could that I could train dogs, so so it wasn't really a problem. Okay, cool. I think that's helpful for people that might want to understand the way you think with regards to being in potential social pressure. Yeah, and and also it's um, I guess I have some kind of interesting personality because I'm I guess I'm what they call a mismatcher. So I'm very good at finding mistakes or or differences so so i mean if i can see that i have something that is different than how things are already being done uh, that is very very reinforcing for me to do so (laughs) so in so in a way clicker training was much more interesting 20 years ago than today for me (laughs) But uh, that, that's a we- that, that's a weakness and a strength in my personality. I can't excuse it really, but uh, it's kind of interesting. I like that. So does that involve you being comfortable asking the hard questions and challenging people's views? Would you say or? Oh yeah, I'm sure I've been a pain in the ass for a lot of people <laughs> growing up. <laughs> I hope I'm <laughs> a little bit more mature nowadays, but. Uh, uh, looking back, I can see that I must have been very irritating for a lot of people. But uh, I guess, you know, I, I was young and passionate about dog training and clicker training. So, and you wouldn't potentially be where you are today if you hadn't. No, well, I, I, I couldn't done otherwise. <laughs> I mean, that's something that um, is, that I, I know now that you you can't really do anything else than <laughs> than what your environment is selecting for you, really. So <laughs> that's a nice excuse to have. <laughs> <laughs> well said. And so this this position you have to be you to be Morton over the last twenty years has evolved you into a trainer today. Would you say that? Has a you kind of own approach to to clicker training and dog training? Yeah, yeah. That's, I think our approach is um, kind of a little bit different from a lot of other clicker trainers. Uh, I think both me and Cecilia we have kind of listened. Uh, of course, we, we have trained together with a lot of other good trainers, but I don't think we. have we have kind of listened most to what we have done ourselves and and seen how that works. So, so I, th- I think what was really useful to both me and Cecilia was that uh, we knew about behavior analysis 
before we discovered clicky training because we have both uh, studied psychology uh, at the university. So, so when we first read about clicky training, it just connected all the dots for us. And we already knew about these learning principles. So, so it was kind of everything opened up and <laughs> we can, it was sort of, we could see everything so clearly. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting because I feel some people start training and then learn about applied behavior analysis and then say that for them everything opens up. But you kind of went the yeah, other way yeah. around. Yeah, and I think even though clicky training is building on applied behavior analysis, it's not. It's the same, but it's not the same. In I mean, I have met brilliant behavior analysts, but they don't know really about practical dog training and they really can't connect the dot the, the dots even though they know all those theoretical principles uh, and then on the on the other hand you have brilliant practical dog trainers who do everything correctly <laughs> but they, they are not necessarily aware of the underlying principles uh, so, so I, I think that was um, i think it was important for us that we already were kind of fluent in all the basic principles of behavior analysis before we learned about clicky training. Mm, so it's rare, would you say? What's your input there to, to find people that have both of those pieces of the puzzle? Uh, it was a very, very rare 20 years ago. <laughs> I think it's becoming more and more... Uh, I think that there are more and more good trainers nowadays. I, th I think for the last five years, I'm I'm kind of amazed how 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 good people are in uh, how good their their knowledge are about behavior analysis, because I think the first ten years um, people tried to do clicky training and they they did what they read about, they did what they were told but they didn't really understand the underlying principles. But nowadays, I think much because of internet, click or expo has been important. I think people are much more aware now um, that the connection between clicker training and applied mm -hmm. behavior analysis. So that's interesting. And we're going to talk about your approach to dog training more. We've got a couple of mm. topics that we're really going to dive into, but just want to mention yeah. something there. You said Clicker Expo, and you've kind of, and something we're going to talk about is your your approach to dog training, which is potentially different than American in your mind. Is, is that correct? However, you still traveled to the States, and you, you've been a big part of Clicker Expo, haven't you? Yeah, we're... It was a long time since we lectured at Clicker Training, the Clicker Rex for the first time. I think that's ten or twelve years ago. I don't. It was one of the first few years. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember anyway. But um, no, the this is. Uh, I mean, Clicker Training is Clicker Training, but also Clicker Training can be. There can be a lot of different uh, styles within Clicker Training, and. What we found when we were teaching in US the first years was that um, many people were kind of uh, shocked how, how how our dogs behaved because I mean, the, the, the core of clicky training for me is what we can call voluntary behaviors. Uh, I mean, I, I want my dog to offer behavior while I'm just standing there, clicking, reinforcing, and then I want the dog to offer that behavior again and again and again and again and again. And I do not want to cue the dog or help the dog with my body language or so on. I want the dog to offer the behavior uh, voluntary and as independent of me as possible. The, that's really the, um, the core of click training for me. And I mean, th this was when I read Karen Pryor's book, uh, I think it was A Dog and a Dolphin. That was the first clicky training book I read. To, must have been 20 years ago now. And she, she wrote, first get the behavior and let the dog repeat, offering that behavior time after time, and then add the cue. When I read that, it just 
yeah, I, I could hear angels singing or something. <laughs> I think um, it was so brilliant. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I, I never, never became the same person again. Wow. <laughs> so uh, it's just brilliant that you can teach the behavior first and then start adding the cue in the background, just adding the verbal cue in the background and then kind of moving the cue a little bit earlier and then starting to only only reinforce the behavior when you have uh, given the cue first and so on. I think that that was brilliant. And so it was kind of surprising to come to US and see that they did not really put that much emphasis on voluntary behaviors as I thought was the meaning of clicky training. So that, that, that was interesting because what I'm seeing as, as at least the first years we went to US, we saw that uh, the, the American style of clicky training was very much uh, lure the dog with the treat and then click. And then they didn't really fade the lure. They just kind of made it smaller and then transformed that lure into into a, a visible cue, like a hand signal. And and when you go from luring the behavior with the treat and then transforming that movement into a hand signal. There is really no voluntary behavior there at any point. The dog is only following your lead all the way. Uh, and of course, that's positive dog training, and it's just not what I'm interested in. The, I'm not hearing any angels singing when I see that kind of training. <laughs> I, love, I, love <laughs> I, I really want a dog who is kind of throwing behaviors at me. Uh, I, I want it to be... Uh, I want, if it's difficult to stop the dog from throwing behaviors at me, I'm a happy man. That's what I want. And um, because, I mean, the, the, ob the objective for animal training for me is to train fluent behaviors. That, that, that's the goal. I mean, I, I, my interest was in, in uh, high-level competition training. So, so my goal is to train really solid, fluent precision behaviors and and teaching the dog to offer voluntary behaviors is the best way to teach a fluent behavior because if the dog can learn to repeat that behavior voluntarily like 15 to 20 times in 60 seconds then you have a really solid behavior and and it's a very big difference between a behavior the dog can offer like six, seven times a minute and the same behavior when the dog can offer it like 15 to 20 times a minute. It's really not the same behavior anymore. So when you have a fluent behavior, that behavior has changed completely. And, it's that, and, and now I can really use that behavior for something useful. Uh, I have really no use for a behavior if the dog can only do it like do a sit six times a minute that's not good enough that behavior will break down very soon if i start to combine it with other behaviors or train changing up the situations and so on so so fluency is really really key and if you start training the behavior voluntarily get the fluency level up to like 15 20 times for for short behaviors and then start adding the cue. It's, it's so simple to add a solid verbal cue that is very much independent of anything else than actually the verbal cue and just me being around. So, and you, you don't get the same, that same attitude when you are luring the dog all the time. It's just, just not the same, it, not the same uh, result. So I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So going back to, to the start, you're, at the start you said you don't want to be offering any cues and you're talking about when shaping the behavior, you're going to add that cue later. Yeah. So, so, so let's say the behavior is, uh, let's take a simple behavior as uh, down. The, then the first step for me would be to, the, the goal would be to teach the dog to offer the down behavior in, let's say, 18 times in 16, in 60 seconds when I'm just standing quietly in front of the dog. That's the goal. Uh, 
if you want to learn the dog in the beginning, that that's fine. Uh, but what I'm not so fond of if is if you never remove that lure at all. So I think I think it's fine if you if you if you have to lure the down and then you fade fade the the, the lure, and then you can stand quietly and the dog is offering the behavior voluntarily that's fine you don't necessarily have to start with free shaping even though i prefer that and i usually do that but i think the most important thing is that you have this phase in the training where the dog is literally 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 throwing the behavior at you and you really build that fluency before you add the cue and get it under stimulus control I think that that's a really important. So you said free shaping then, and for you, the the definition of voluntary behaviour is, is you're standing there. Would you say completely like not moving, not saying anything, and and just waiting for that animal to throw yeah, that behaviour at you? Well, I'm I'm not really. The, you you can start you you can start training a behaviour in in many different ways. You you can lure it. You can use targeting. You can free shape it just standing there. There are a lot of different solutions. But whatever technique you are using, uh, my goal would be to to be able to just stand there quietly and the dog offer the behavior independent, independently of my movements in 15 to 16, 20 times a minute. And then I can start adding the cue. And... Uh, and of course, the the reason this is important to me is that in in uh, at least in in the Nordic countries, you 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 need a solid verbal cue in competitions. So if you have trained a behavior that is as independent of the of the handler as possible, it's so much easier to to add a reliable cue to the to the behavior. But if you have a behavior that has kind of always been a little bit dependent on how you are moving your hand, how you are looking at the dog, that you are kind of bending towards the dog and so on, then you really you never really learn the dog a clean verbal cue. And um, that, that's always my goal, to have a very clean verbal cue so the dog is responding to the verbal cue and not and is as independent of me as possible of course i i am i'm the part of the picture usually but it's a big difference um just to to kind of um to to, to stand up straight and to do do all those things with your hands to get the behavior so if, if you're standing there straight and, and try not to move and, and trying to get the free shape and get the dog to throw those behaviors out, does the does your still body language and your lack of vocalization, et cetera, lack of hand movements become an antecedent that says to the dog, try stuff? Yeah, yeah, the, the, that's right. But there's an interesting, di- uh, uh, an important difference is that I want to teach the dog to offer the behavior while I'm doing things, things that I'm allowed to do in the competition ring. And in the competition ring, I'm allowed to, <laughs> to stand straight with my arms uh, down and I'm uh, allowed to, to walk and so on, but I'm not allowed to bend over the dog or stare at it or do things with my hands. So, so that, that's an important difference. So I, I want to teach a dog to offer the behavior while I'm doing things I'm allowed to do in competitions. The, does that make it sense? Does, yes, and you mentioned that mm. then you want to get the dog up to fluency. And fluency for you means that within the space of 60 seconds, the dog's doing it a set amount of times? Yeah, for for short behaviors like... Uh, sit down heel so on uh, usually 15 to 20 times a minute is a good fluency level uh, and for other behaviors the it's a little bit different but but the main main point is that when the dog offer the behavior you click and treat then the dog offer it again as soon as possible so that's what fluency is really and um, 
uh, for for me, the the reason I am a clicky trainer is that I think it's the best way to build fluent behaviors. Because a, a clicky training is by nature um, a kind of a, a fluency based technology where the way we usually click it train is the dog offer the behavior we click it the dog does it again and again and again and again until we have built a good enough fluency and then we can start adding the cue and start using that behavior in other contexts but first we build fluency through repetition lots of repetitions and the- and most, and I think most dog trainers underestimate how many repetitions you really need to build a really solid, fluent behavior. Uh, and, and it's so important because, I mean, if the dog can offer twenty downs a minute, if I can get to that level, that my dog will never ever forget that behavior. I, I can stop training it for like eight years, and the dog will still remember it. Uh, it's like learning to ride a bike. When you have achieved real fluency, that behavior will always be there as long as the dog's alive. But when you only have a fluency level of like six, seven a minute, then that behavior will be gone next month if you don't, if you don't continue to train it. And, and the problem with for many obedience trainers is that they start adding the, adding the cue much too early and they start uh, using behaviors in in chains when those behaviors aren't really fluent enough. And the result, of course, is that next week that chain breaks down because the the behavior isn't fluent enough. So uh, fluency, that's really the answer answer to, to anything. When when if one of my students has a problem with an obedience exercise, the, uh, I know what basic skills the dog needs to be able to pre- perform that exercise. It, it may be five or six different basic skills in that obedience exercise. And if the student says that she has a problem with that exercise, then I usually can first find the, we- the, the weak part of the chain and then I can ask, what is your fluency level on that behavior? Uh, and it's always too low. <laughs> so so the, then the solution is to increase the fluency on that behavior. And then when you put it back into the chain, it works. So, so for me, really, dog training is very much, it's very predictable. It's almost like, almost like math. If you have the right fluency level, then that obedience exercise will be be reliable. And if you doesn't have it, then you will have trouble next week or next month or next year. Uh, That's just the way it is. So So when you're asking your uh, student or client what the fluency level is, the answer you're looking for is how often that animal will repeat that behavior uncued in a 60-second period? Or does it matter if it's cued or not? Well, well I, I would like to see both. I f- first of all, I would like to see uh, the affluent voluntary behavior. Uh, and if I see that, okay, the fluency level is good enough, then the ne- next step is to get a reliable cue on that behavior. And, and then I would very much like to see uh, like the, the 10 repetitions in a row on cue, uh, but that's the next step. So, uh, and, uh, and that's another thing. If when people have a problem with a cue, it's, it's not the cue that's the problem usually. The problem is usually that, that that underlying behavior is not good enough. It's not fluent enough. So when I'm fixing up a cue who's kind of broken, I always go back to teaching the dog to offer the behavior voluntarily. I'm building that up to uh, a good enough fluency level. And then I start adding the cue again. Uh, and, and then the cue is working because it wasn't really the cue that was the problem in the first place. The problem was that the fluency wasn't there. And also it's a, it's a big advantage to, to have that voluntary fluent behavior before you start adding the cue because... If you start adding the cue when you only have like, let's say, six or seven repetitions in 60 seconds, 
then the dog will do a lot of mistakes when you give it the cue. And then you will start kind of uh, diluting the cue. You will give the cue, but the dog will do a lot of mistakes. Uh, and that does not give you a, a reliable cue. But when you have this really fluent voluntary behavior first, and when you then start adding the cue, it's very easy to be like 95 to 100% success rate because the dog knows the behavior. It, it, <laughs> so the, the um, overriding message is for us to, and us being people listening to this podcast, to to mm. get the fluency and do more repetitions uh, and and add the cue after we've got high fluency without the cue. Yeah, the, 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 that's that's very important. And the method of free shaping. So we're standing there. There's mm. the animals throwing the behaviour at us versus luring the dog yeah. or animal, whatever we're training into that behaviour. There's. Would you say? Yeah, and, and, and just, just let me say that. It's fine to start with luring, but just fade that lure as soon as possible, and, and then get to get to what looks like free shaping. Because <laughs> if you don't, there's going to be different learning happening. Would you say? Yeah, yeah. But you, you, if you start adding a verbal cue while while you are still using your hands, that visual cue will kind of block that verbal cue. So. It's, so it will the results will be very different. Have you got any examples that you can think of? Yeah, the same simple example like down again. If the dog is still dependent on you moving your hand downwards, uh, and and you start adding the down the verbal down cue while you're still using your hand, um, you 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 tend not to get that that really clean verbal cue and people say that they okay my plan is to kind of fade the visual cue later but in my experience they usually never do it <laughs> and, and I, I know that in in us you are allowed to use more visual cues in competitions than you are in Norway. So, so that, that's a difference. So that's, I guess, one thing that explains also that there's a little bit of difference in training styles. But um, for, for me, at least, it, it's important that the dog responds to my verbal cue, even when he can't s see my body or see my mov movements. And would you say that... Sorry, go uh, on. Uh, so and and just teaching the dog to offer the behavior as independent as possible of of you, as a, as a, as the trainer that just take care of all those uh, problems. And and would you say that in your experience, dogs who have been mostly taught via free shaping versus taught by luring, what's the oh, difference? Yes. Or. Uh, or I can see the difference in the first 15 seconds. It's so easy to see the difference because generally when, when the dog is um, really haven't learned to offer voluntary behaviors, it's always the dog trainer who is starting the behavior by some kind of movement. And it's not really the dog who is in control. It's always the handler who take, takes the in initiative by doing some kind of movement. And I always want my dog to tell, tell me when I'm going to start training. So if I'm, if I'm training, for example, uh, let's say he healing, um, then what I would do is just uh, stand still in front of the dog and then just leave it to the dog to decide when he's ready to start working. And the way he tells me is that he immediately offers heel position and when he, when he sits in heel position, he stares at me. He st really stares at me, like telling me to come on, daddy, start walking. Come on, start walking. And when he looks at me that way, okay, then I can start healing. So, so it's, it's the dog who is kind of get, gets me going, not the other way around. And, and it's so much more to train obedience with that kind of dog. Who so the, the, the dog is driving you and not the, not the other way around. 
So that, that's the attitude I want in, in an obedience dog. And when you wrote down a couple of things for us to discuss today with regards to your approach to dog training, you wrote down basic skills. Is this stuff falling into your category of basic skills, that building that eye contact, et cetera, and, and just having mindset yeah. of fluency? Yeah. Uh, when I start training a new puppy for for, for obedience or working dog competitions or, or, or whatever, uh, I had uh, I have this list of basic skills that I know I need to teach him if he if he should he, to to be able to do those obedience uh, advanced obedience exercises later and I, I I know the fluency level of every one of those basic skills I think for um, the Norwegian competitions we have defined like nineteen different uh, basic skills. Uh, let, let's say 19 categories and within each category there are like four five six variations of that behavior so um, uh, sit could be one basic skill and but a dog needs to learn to sit in front of me he learns to must learn to sit while i'm moving uh, he must learn to sit from laying down and so on. So, so there's a lot of there, there's some different variations of each uh, behavior, but um, the, the, there are about 19 big behaviors with some variations. And I need every one of those basic skills fluent. And when I have that, when I have that, it's so much fun to train that dog, and it's so simple to develop all those advanced obedience exercises because all the building blocks are there and when i'm when i'm teaching all those basic skills during the first year i have that dog uh, the dog is not only learning the behaviors he, he also learns uh, a lot of let's say concepts he learns to kind of, he learns to that he has to start behaviors himself he can't just wait for me to do something the dog learns that he has to do something himself to get me to click or to start some kind of activity. Uh, and he also learns that when I click a behavior, that becomes kind of a cue to offer that same behavior again and again and again until I eventually change the rules and start clicking another behavior. And that's also very useful when you're building fluency. And so, so, so you, get, you get this very very funny clicky training attitude when you are when you are working with those voluntary basic skills that first year and, and many people say that free shaping is hard and but the reason it's hard is that you have to to build the dog's free shaping skills uh, piece by piece you you start by very simple behaviors and then you take a little more difficult behavior and then you build on that. And when you have free shaped like the first six, seven behaviors, uh, the next six or seven behaviors are so much easier to free shape because the dog is starting to get some, let's say, understanding of, of the concepts of, of how the rules of the games, of, of the game works. And getting the... Um, Sorry, go on. Uh, and of course, if you always lure the dog and it's always you who take the initiative when the dog is supposed to do something, mm -hmm. then the, then your dog will learn that, that set of rules uh, and it will give a very different result. So, so for me, clicky training, that's what clicky training is about for me. I, I want to see a dog who is really offering behaviors as independent of the dog trainer as possible. The, the dog trainer, of course, has to be there. <laughs> he has to be part of the picture. But it's um, it's a long way from just being around the dog and doing all those things with your hands and body. And and what's and also when when you when you are helping your dog a lot, you will also reinforce a lot of wrong behaviors because the, most people when when do you help your dog well it's usually when the dog is doing nothing that's when you present all those lures or body movements you you move your legs you do something with your hands and so on 
And then you reinforce the dog for just standing there and waiting. And when you do that for a year, uh, that, that's not a clicky trained dog in, in my book because the, that dog is way too passive. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail now. <laughs> I, I, I hope not. It's, it's a good thing I don't care. I hope, not. I hope that, and, and my assumption would be this is really beneficial for everyone listening to it. Yeah, I, 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 I mean it well because it, it's such a big difference between leave leave the work to the dog your job is to mark the behaviors and and find the right criteria and and please as much as possible reinforce the dog for doing things on its own initiative and please do not reinforce the dog for just standing there passive doing nothing it's it's so so important unless you want the dog who is very passive because a lot of pet dog owners, that's what they want. They want the passive dog who doesn't give them any trouble. And so in some ways, I guess that, that could be kind of convenient. Um, because I, I guess some for some pet dog owners, it can be kind of, kind of scary to see a dog who is very active and offering behaviors all the time. Because how can I how can I control this? He's just throwing behaviors at me all the time. But uh, that is of course only the first step of the training. And and you and one of a, a very important voluntary behavior that you want in your dog is the behavior of uh, waiting or just uh, free freezing in a position. That's also a voluntary behavior. So all voluntary behavior do not have to be movement. It's also important to teach the dog to voluntary freeze in a position. So you have to find a balance. But uh, I think that there's there's an interesting difference there. Some I think some positive trainers they are I think their focus is on on make on making the dog very calm, just removing all the stress and and so on because. If there are no arousal there, then the dog is behaving. And that's convenient, but it's, it's not very interesting. So, so what I want is a very active dog, but a very active dog with skills. I want a very active dog with a lot of fluent behaviors. I want a dog who knows stuff, knows how to do stuff, because then my dog can be very active, very alive, but I have all those great fluent behaviors, so I still have an obedient dog. I think that's an interesting difference, also. And I don't don't know if that makes sense. It, it, it all makes sense. <laughs> but, and I've got a million questions. I just I just want to jump to one yeah. of the topics you talked about there, which was teaching a dog a freeze. Now, do you teach? frozen position separately or do you teach the dog a yeah a frozen to, to, to freeze in uh, sit position in heel position in standing position all, all, all those are basic skills that is just as important as, as as sitting down laying down running towards me grabbing the dumbbell all those active movements and just fr freezing in a position is just one more behavior. And you can free shape. It's, it's very easy to free shape that behavior because most dogs offer the first, first second of freeze for free. And then you just build from there. And do you train? And the reason I'm asking this is because we're talking about it in the ATA, animal yeah. training academy community the other day. So I'm interested. Do you do you train yeah. uh, a freeze cue ever? So it doesn't matter what position in you're in. If I say freeze, you just immediately stop, or do you train all those behaviours separately? So yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, the first step for me is to teach the dog to freeze voluntarily. Ideally, I do not want to use any stay signals, no hand signals, no nothing. I just want the dog to offer a freeze and then I click and reinforce that and gradually increases the time up to, let's say, 10 seconds for a start. And when the dog really starts to offer that, that freeze behavior, then I can start adding the stay cue if I, if I want to do that. So it's really exactly the same as every other active behavior. 
and the advantage of teaching it as independent of my movement as possible is that when I add that verbal stay cue, that verbal stay cue actually works. I do not have to use my hands in addition to that verbal stay cue. So it's, it's, uh, the, the freeze behavior is, is really not no different from every other active basic skill in my book, if that makes sense. It does. And I just want to additionally build upon something you said, because you have written down something similar in the topics you were thinking about covering today, you thought would be beneficial to cover today. And, and that topic was mm-hmm. how to market clicker training to dog owners. And you said potentially dog owners might want a different type of dog. What's your input yeah, there? Yeah. And, and how do you go about marketing clicker training to, to dog owners? And when you say this, are you talking about your run-of-the-mill everyday dog owner or dog owners that are already interested in training their dogs more? Yeah, well, I think I would go about it a little different if it was uh, a pet dog owner and a dog owner who was training for competitions or search and rescue or, or whatever. But I guess what I had in mind when I brought up that topic, I think was something a little bit different. Um, uh, and I, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit scary to, to go into this territory if, I don't know how much time we have and I'm not formulating myself as precise in English as I <laughs> sometimes want to. But I, th- I think w- when I started clicker training 20 years ago, uh, I think it was very important to teach people an alternative to correction-based training. So it was really important to teach people the difference between uh, training with positive reinforcement and, let's say, correction-based training. So, and the first 10 years, then it was kind of, there was some polarization there between clicker trainers who were very very good with their dogs and correction-based trainers who were uh, mean to their dogs. You, you know, but um, I, I think nowadays, I think that uh, a lot of clicker trainers nowadays also talk a lot about uh, animal welfare as an important reason why they clicker train. And, and you, often, you, you still often see clicker trainers who are criticizing people who are uh, using aversives in the training and so on. And I actually think it's important that we kind of try to not, this may sound a little strange, but I would kind of wish we didn't pay too much attention to the difference between uh, positive reinforcement training and yeah, negative reinforcement based training. And maybe instead focus much more on how we as positive reinforcement based trainers can really improve our technology because there are a lot of uh, clicky trainers who um, they are really good to their dogs (laughs) Uh, but they are not necessarily good trainers that's two different things being kind to your dog and being a good trainers it's not the same thing. And um, what I see a lot, at, especially in competition training, is that I mean, the best way to market positive dog training and clicky training, that is to, to show other trainers that your dog, really, uh, your dog has really good fluent behaviors, high precision fluent behaviors. That's the best marketing you could, you could wish for. And I, I would like us to get away from criticizing people who, who you still use punishment and instead only focus on how can I improve my own clicky training. And maybe, maybe we should be a little more results oriented than animal welfare oriented. 
because I don't think there is any contradiction there. I mean, if you click a train effectively, I mean, the animal welfare part is built into it because when you are clicky training, when you are clicky training in, in a good way, the animal is in control. And of course, there are all, you can do high level things to improve the animal, animal welfare even more. But I'm not sure that's the best selling point when you want to market uh, clicker training to that other other camp. And it, uh, I've thought about this a lot lately because I, it's kind of easy to see some similarities between uh, politics, especially in US where it's very polarized, you know, where on the one side you have very conservative kind of dogmatic forces and on the other side you have those very idealistic <laughs> people who criticizes capitalism and all those they have very good motives but not always very good answers to how things uh, should be done in practice and i really do not want clicky training to end up in that situation because as clicky trainers we are also living in this you know social media echo chamber and in in our echo chamber it's very easy for for a certain kind of behavior to be reinforced where we um we pay so much attention to being kind to the dogs and making life so nice and simple and convenient for our dogs uh, and it, it can be more and more extreme in that echo chamber. Um, and I think, I don't think that's a good way to market clicky training to that other camp. It will may only increase the distance. So I think that what could, uh, it is, it's very easy to, to misunderstand this. So, but I think w what I would like to see more of is that even though we are part of a group of people who think the same. And, and it's, it's very important to have the support of people like that. But at the same time, it's important to step out of that, step out of that bubble now and then. And because that, that's the only way you <laughs> really can have an effect on, on the other side if you want to, if you want them to learn about clicky training too. And maybe the best way to market clicker training is not to sell that most extreme variant of clicker training where but so, so so i i guess i want i think that if we if we are a little bit more results oriented and we focus on building precise behaviors fluent behaviors we're focusing on developing our skills in better timing better criteria reinforce reinforcing behavior better and so on uh, and using all those scientific principles i think it's much easier to to kind of meet meet the, the other trainers sort of in the middle um these are very loose thoughts and i did not really formulate this as precise as i wanted well, what is your impression from what i just said i think it sounds completely reasonable rational and it reminds me of something you said earlier where when you were first starting you let the dog's behavior the results of the dog speak for this new technology that you were using clicker training and yeah. i think it's going to be impossible for anyone to say and sit here in 2018 and look at what you've done with canis and clicker training in your region and globally uh, and how many dogs lives you've changed and say that you, that you haven't been successful at influencing positive change yeah and I, and i i don't think i ever have really put much emphasis on on being kind to the dogs and and the reason is that the moment i start emphasizing that i'm so kind with my dogs i also sort of imply that people who are not clicker training are, are not kind to their dogs. It kind of, it kind of, it follows from that assumption. So, so that's why I really do not want to focus much on that. I want to focus on things like timing criteria, 
reinforcement, <laughs> all those observable things, and really to to some extent take take the ethics a little bit out of it. And I can sleep very well doing that because I know that this way of training is is really good for the dogs and and for the people. I mean, so. And I think that just leads to a lot less polarization be- between the camps. And also, I would I would like to see. For for me, it's actually it's more important to see to see clicky trainers improving their own skills than to see, let's say, traditional dog trainers uh, moving over to our side. Because as soon as they see uh, good clicky trained dogs. They will, they will start to gravitate towards that because um, that, that's just the way things work. And if we start um, talking too much about that you should be kind with your dogs and not punish it, then you only get counter control. And that's terrible shaping of other dog owners. So, so uh, I think it's important that we as clicky trainers focus on ourselves and improving our own skills. And then people will, people will follow. I think that's sage advice, and I don't think anyone can argue with that yeah. logic. Hey, just looking at the time, and conscious mm. that, and thank you as well, I should say, before I move on, very much for giving us such a deep and thoughtful description of, of how you think about this. I really look forward to listening back to this and, and thinking, <laughs> thinking over this more now as we are in February and we're about to release this podcast but also over the coming years and because we're all involved in this I think most of the people that listen to this podcast are are involved in this journey and helping to shape the future for for dogs and all of our learners all of our different species so really appreciate your input there was just before we finish up one other subject that you wrote about to me that you'd be interested in talking about today and something that when we caught up for a Skype call a few weeks ago you started telling me about it and I'm actually really interested. So I want to just finish on this uh, as our last kind of okay. conversation. You are now heavily involved in teaching instructors, t- teaching yeah. other people to instruct clicker training. And you've got what you call a benchmarking system. Yeah. Uh, it's some, it's, um, it's, it's a teaching tool that, um, that um, me and Cecilia have developed during the last uh, three years. Um and it's really just um, a way of thinking about the skill of clicker training, just to um, kind of try to break it, to break that the big skill of clicker training. We are trying to break it down in smaller parts, so that it's easier for for new instructors to to, to know where to look, to, where, where to look when they want to improve their own training and their students' training. So. Um, what we have done basically is that we have kind of divided the art of clicker training into to eight broad categories. Uh, and these categories are uh, timing, uh, criteria, reinforcement, voluntary behaviors, uh, stimulus control, uh, training, and also something that we call training focus, and at last, mechanical skills. And all these eight categories, we are talking about uh, the dog trainer's behavior. Not the dog, but the trainer's behavior. Because um, clicky training a dog, that, that is a behavior that you have to develop as a dog trainer. There's a lot of different behaviors you need to build fluency in. And um, if you take, for example, the first category of timing, um, that category again can be broken down into yeah, six or seven uh, trainer skills. I can just mention a few of them just to give people uh, an ID. Uh, one obvious timing skill is uh, the precision on uh, your marker signal. So do you click precisely or are you half a second late, for example? Uh, the, the next skill is, are you actually using the clicker or are you using another marker, which is not that precise as the clicker? Um, another skill, timing skill is that 
uh, when you click or use another marker, do you always reward after the marker? And in my book, that should be 100%. <laughs> um, but, but, but timing is also even more than the clicker. Uh, the fourth timing skill is uh, something I call, I uh, have to translate this, it's that you are precise in when you uh, when you uh, when when you are starting some activity. Uh, an example would be uh, if you are training the dog to to hold uh, the dumbbell. Uh, let's say the dog is sitting in heel position, and the moment the dog is looking looking up at you, then you present the dumbbell right in front of the dog. That is kind of precise. Um, what we, we see in new trainers is that the dog is look it, looking at them for one second, two seconds, three seconds, and then they present the dumbbell. That would be uh, not very fluent on, on that skill. And then again, you have precision when it comes to using cues and so on. Um, and also that you are not moving until after the click. That is also a timing skill. So there are several skills within the category of timing. Uh, and, and, and it is the same in every one of these eight categories. That there are several concrete skills within that category. I think we have uh, defined uh, s about 60 different skills all in all. So, so during our instructor course, uh, our students learn to learn what each of these skills look like on beginner level, on intermediate level, and on expert level. So for example, when you have the precision, um, uh, the timing skill of um, click, clicking precisely, uh, on beginner level, uh, the way that skill looks is that the trainer will usually be from 0 0.5 to 2 seconds late on every click. Have you seen the same? <laughs> yeah. And then when people are starting to get more experience and moving up to intermediate level, then most of the clicks will be precise enough. And with precise enough, I mean that you are reinforcing, you're not reinforcing the wrong behavior at least. <laughs> and usually you are right on target. But uh, you can still see a difference when you move up to the expert level. Because when you, s at least when I see um, a really skilled clicker training, a really skilled clicker trainer, then it's like I, he or she is clicking so precisely that I notice. I really notice that, wow, that was precise. That's really photo quality precision. You can hear the uh, and, and angels he, in the background singing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I can feel the difference. But the, of course, the, the, this is very obje objective. If you can, if you, if you, if you look at the training movie and you run it in in slow motion you, you can see see the difference very clearly and um, so but that's that's the way the, that this benchmarking system is built there are 60 different skills and we have tried to dis describe what does this skill looks like on beginner level intermediate level and expert level because when a new instructor knows the difference between okay this this is what a beginner looks looks like on this skill this is what an, an a little more advanced trend looks like but this is where we want to go we want to go to the expert level then, then it's much easier to know where to focus to improve your training it, it makes it very concrete so so in our instructor training we usually we, we do one week where we only focus on, on these different timing skills first. Uh, and that really changes people's training, even though, though they were actually really good already. But just, just focusing on these specific trainer skills and all the time having in the back of your mind what it looks like when an expert is doing it, that makes you move in that direction. 
and you also start paying attention when you are a little bit off target because uh, a lot of clicker trainers they don't really pay attention if they are clicking uh, 0.3 seconds late they don't pay attention to that as long as they get away with it uh, but just being a little bit more precise can make you make your training so much more efficient when you do that every day for several years uh, and it's the same thing with every trainer skill in all those other categories too so, so it's been very helpful to, to have this benchmarking system and uh, I learned a lot while I was writing it it took it took a very long time <laughs> how, how long did it take uh, Oh, I, I used at least uh, at least a year before I had the, um, something that looked like what I have now. And of course, I, I keep improving it. Sounds amazing. I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, wish, we should uh, translate it to English, yes. but we, we, uh, I'm, I'm still I'm still kind of working on it. And I, I don't want to translate it before I'm really happy really happy with it so but i think we're soon there so and you said the last uh, benchmarking element is you call training focus yeah um it's um it's the the main idea is to to have a plan for your tra- for for your training session the, the, that, that that's the that's the big idea with training focus and you can measure the degree of training focus by things like the the time spent on the training field where the dog is not working being reinforced or is on a break <laughs> so if the dog if you're doing anything else than think plan do we often call it dead time uh, and that's kind of the time where you are not really paying attention to the dog, but the dog is uh, right there with you and he's paying attention to you and he's even maybe offering some behaviors. But because you don't have a plan and you are not paying attention to the dog, you are missing a lot of clickable moments. <laughs> so so that, that's, a, that's one reason that you should, when you are actually training with your dog, you should always have, you should know what to do from start to finish as, mo- as mu- much as possible. Because if the dog from, from very young learns that when we are training together, I always have the possibility to earn reinforcement as long as I keep offering behaviors. It's a very big difference between that and a dog that okay, maybe my trainer is training now, but maybe he's not paying attention to me. So maybe I should go over there and pay attention to something else instead. You, you, you get a very different attitude if you're not careful about your, let's say, training focus. So, um, so, so it's about planning your training. And I guess uh, Eva and Emily, they talk a lot about this um just using your your rewards to transport your dog to the next starting point so there is no dead time between the repetitions and so on uh, that really improves the efficiency of the training and it um also that you have good routines so the dog knows when it's on a break and when it's actually supposed to offer behavior that's also part of this was that uh, answering the question <laughs> very cool and and the problem is when you answer a question it just generates about 20 more in my mind <laughs> but yeah looking at we can talk next yeah week. looking at looking <laughs> at the time we we should start to head towards the end so we'll start to wrap up but before we officially do, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, Morton, thank you so much for, for making time out of your evening. It's nearly midnight there where you are. We really appreciate you doing this. <laughs> thank you. A- and do you want to tell everyone just before we do end where they can go to find out more information about you and what you guys are up to? 
Well, first of all, you must uh, learn to read Norwegian, and then I'm sure you'll find me. <laughs> no, I, no I, I don't really have much to offer the English-speaking audience right now. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, me and Cecilia, we did a lot of travel before uh, abroad, but uh, we have two kids now and four horses, so we, we try to stay home as much as possible. Uh, and we we mostly focus on the on the Nordic market now. With uh, so 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 what, what I'm doing basically these days is doing my doing the instructor training. Uh, that's what I do basically these days. Um, but uh, the the kids will grow up, and then maybe we can start <laughs> traveling again. Mm-hmm. And for people in in your region, what's the website? Just in case they want to go check it out. And I've been on your website. I, I just use the Google Translator function and i can read it all in english yeah if you search for my name or for canis i'm, I'm sure you find definitely me. we do yeah. of course really appreciate all of you out there tuning in as well so if you've enjoyed the episode and if you are interested in carrying this conversation on even further about the most positive least intrusive ways of influencing behavior then as mentioned at the start of the episode the animal training academy community is waiting for you head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn all about how you can connect with more like-minded positive reinforcement based animal trainers from around the globe whether you're training or thinking about training dogs cats other pets birds zoo animals implementing techniques within your vet clinic the list goes on and on any area where behavior management is required you'll love all the different ways you can join in forums whatsapp private facebook group live members only web classes and of course all of the content available in the members area there is something there for absolutely everyone we are looking forward to having you join our family that's it for this episode though we will officially now wrap it up there thanks again so much for listening but for now take care polar bear you'll hear from us again soon